Good afternoon. Thanks for being here, everyone. Calling this uh, committee of the or this meeting of the tax committee for February 7th to order. Um, we do have a quorum of members present. First item on the agenda is approving the minutes from February 2nd. Vice Chair Norris, did you have a chance to review the minutes? I did, Chair Gomez. I was hoping for a more glowing description of my presentation of House File 915, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I will move to approve the minutes from the February 2nd meeting. We'll try to uh, zhuzh those up for you next time, Vice Chair. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Not seeing any. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. All right, motion carries. The minutes from February 2nd, 2023 are adopted. All right, so we have a few bills today. For, is Representative Agbaje here? Maybe she's not. We'll, we'll go to the, to, uh, sorry. Representative, oh, Representative Robbins isn't with us. Uh, well, <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> 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 can we all hum the Jeopardy theme together or something? I don't know. Madam Chair, could we talk about loopholes? Uh -oh. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a uh, complete. Oh, all right. Re Representative Robbins, are you ready to roll? Sorry, we were, we were sort of holding tax committee for you, even though you aren't supposed to be first. We appreciate you coming up. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I thought it was third and I brought the wrong folder, so I had to run back to my office. No worries. Well, thank you so much for being quick. We appreciate you making it back. Um, so, Representative Robbins, would you like to move that House File uh, 73 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill? I would like to move that, Madam Chair. All right, excellent. Uh, with that, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. This bill has been in process for a number of years. It predates even when I was elected. Representative Hurtas. Um, our former colleague carried this bill for several sessions. And basically, it's a very small change that um, I rewatched the hearing from 2021, and it was included last year in um, the omnibus tax bill. It had no opposition, and so I'll just briefly explain it. So currently, there is a tax credit for parents who have the very tragic situation of having a stillborn infant, and that is current. Minnesota law and it provides for that if the um, stillborn baby is born in Minnesota. But um, as you know, many of our communities are border communities and they do not have hospitals necessarily on the Minnesota side of the border and their provider may be in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, etc. And so those families are currently not eligible to take advantage of this tax credit even though they are Minnesota residents. So this bill simply allows um, families who have a stillborn child um, who um, outside of the state to still be eligible for the tax credit. Um, they expect, um, you know, in 2020, 200 families um, were eligible to take advantage of this. It's not a big change, but it really will be meaningful to those families who go through this tragedy. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Representative Robbins. Um, I don't see any testifiers who have signed up, but if there is anybody in the room who wishes to testify, you can step forward now. Not seeing any. Madam Chair. Yes, Representative Davis. I believe this bill was first in the 2016 bill, and this was to kind of, as, as the author described, to kind of clean up, and I don't recall there being controversy back then at all. So I think this is, we're just, you know, adding folks, and it affects folks such as myself, where the regional centers in La Crosse, Wisconsin. You can do, you know, North Dakota, down into Iowa. Uh, so I, I hope we can get this one across the finish line. It was a tax bill last year, and I, I hope we can support it. Thank you, Representative Davids. Um, is, are, is there any other member that wishes to uh, ask a question or say anything? All right. Can I? Yeah, Representative Pinto. Thank you, um, Chair Gomez. I just, just um, thinking, Reverend Robbins, about the. The original purpose for the credit, knowing this it's a this is just a horrible situation for families, and I'm just I'm thinking about, in a way, is it a is it an expression is it simply expression of sympathy? Um, are there particular expenses that we have in mind? And I, and I don't mean to be questioning um, the gravity of the situation or the purpose of it, um, but just wanting to just get a sense of kind of, of the, for the credit in the first place. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Representative Robbins, you're welcome to go ahead. We can also um, turn to House Research okay. if you want and assist for some of the expenses. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And certainly I'll ask House Research to comment after I give my limited remarks. Um, my understanding um, from following the debate and, and re-looking at the history of it is that families, um, when they have a stillbirth, still in, incur medical expenses. Mm -hmm. And so this is used to offset that, you know, you still go through a delivery. Um, and so this is just a small way to um, help with those costs. And f some families also incur funeral expenses, and it can be used for that. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Um, just going over to, to Mr. Clayman, if you had anything to, off, to uh, add to Representative Robbins. Uh, yep, Madam Chair and Representatives, um, I guess just one other thing to add is that back in 2016 when this was implemented, there was a dependent exemption uh, federally that applied. And, but under the federal IRS rules for dependents, uh, a child cannot be uh, claimed as a dependent under the Internal Revenue Code unless they're born alive. And so to the extent that that dependent exemption could have offset um, some of the costs that Representative Robbins talked about, it would not have been available to the, um, to the individuals um, at the time. And then that would also apply to any other you know, federal benefits that are based on whether a child's claimed as a dependent uh, under the Internal Revenue Code. Thank you for that additional context, uh, Mr. Clayman. Is there any further discussion? Not seeing any. Um, Representative Robbins, did you have any closing comments or would you just like to uh, renew your motion? I'd just like to thank the members and um, hopefully it will be included in the final bill. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, House File 73 is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. All right, next up on the agenda is House File 916. Thank you, Representative Agbaje. Would you like to move that House File 916 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill? Yes, Madam Chair. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, please go ahead and introduce your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, so a few weeks ago, we heard a presentation on the tax expenditure budget and how those are accounted for in, in, our, in our tax bill. Um, so what House File 916 does kind of addresses one of those recommendations that's been discussed, which is to attach purpose statements to all the tax expenditures that we pass as a legislature. So this particular bill takes a retrospective look at the tax expenditures that have passed since the 2014 omnibus tax bill. Um, and what the bill does, it just goes in and outlines what the purpose statements for each of those uh, tax expenditure bills could be. Uh, the bill then applies purpose statements to those expenditures that don't have one listed. And you'll see it goes through 2014, 16, 17, um, and 2019. Um, so we may want to update it for the last one. Um, as we continue to discuss the importance of having transparency in government functions, I think this bill is kind of a step towards that goal. And it will also help us to, with future evaluations to ensure that past tax expenditures are achieving the purpose it's intended. Um, so with that, I am open for member questions. Thank you very much. Before we move to member questions, I'll just see if there's anyone um, who's joined us who would like to testify on this bill. Not seeing anyone. So, uh, Representative Davids. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to the author, I mean, I understand a bill that says in the future and current bills we're going to have purpose statements, but what good does it do to have a purpose statement on something that's already done? And it would be out of order if I mentioned, because you can't talk about the Senate or the governor's office, so it would be out of order if I said how dead this is in the Senate, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. But that being said, the, the, those bills are law. They're already there. And like I said, I can see why we do this, why you might want to do this into the future, but why would we go retroactive? What purpose does that serve? Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative David. So part of the purpose of going retroactively is we do know that we have a number of ex tax expenditure bills that have just been added or just been passed in these various budgets. And so when we go back and we try to find a sense of, well, why did we pass that bill? Why did we think that expenditure was a good idea? Wh what purpose did that serve? Um, sometimes you can go back to the legislative history, but sometimes there's no information there. Um, and so what we've heard from is that having a purpose statement attached to these tax expenditure bills, even if they've already passed, just to say this is why it was passed, this is why it was done, um, can be useful knowledge in the future. 
Representative well, Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I can't remember what I had for supper last night, let alone I carried the 2016 tax bill. Now we're going to put a purpose down. I have no clue what the purpose was on that, um, other than to fund state government and make it work. But I guess, members, I just don't understand. And the representative has a lot of good bills. I'm on a bunch of them. And I'm not saying this is a bad bill. I'm just saying I don't get it. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Davids. Before we go to Representative Spazinski, I guess I'll just uh, share a little of my perspective on this issue um, because I, you and I served together on the Tax Expenditure Review Commission. Um, I think that in general there is a public interest in not allowing tax expenditures to kind of like be passed and then go into a black box and never be subject to the light of day or the scrutiny of the public ever again. Um, and <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So as the chair of the of the Turk over the last, I guess it hasn't even really been a year, but we have gone about trying to establish as 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 directed in, in in statute in the statute that created the Tax Expenditure Review Commission, we've endeavored to to kind of go back, and um, you know the the um, office of the uh, what are they called the LBO the Legislative Budget Office they've developed this whole kind of methodology for it which involves. Uh, you know, kind of going back to when it was passed, trying to establish legis legislative intent, doing literature reviews, um, and looking at other states where they do have purpose statements for similar tax expenditures. And the reason that that's sort of the foundation of the work of the Turk in the first kind of few years is that in order to like know where you are, you have to know where you are trying to get to. And so, you know, the, I, the idea, and, and I obviously, you know, as you can tell, I, I mean, I support this, this effort because, you know, I think with, with, with some tax expenditures, it's really clear what the intent was. Um, with others, it's, it's a little bit less clear. And in order to develop effective uh, metrics evaluation criteria, you do need to establish what that um, sort of the purpose of spending in the tax bill is, which I will say is, is is often like less clear than it is in a direct appropriations committee. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess you know my, my work on 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 sort of uh, trying to bring some more transparency and more attention to tax expenditures over my few years I've served in the legislature is what leads me to to think this is a, this is a good idea. But um, so uh, D David's, did you Representative yeah. David's? And and th yeah. thank you, Madam Chair, for that. Couple questions. I can't remember if the 2016 bill was the smoking hot tax bill or the come together tax bill. It wasn't the don't stop believing tax bill because Governor Dayton vetoed that and then I stopped believing um, in that one. But okay, I wrote the bill 2016. Okay, fine piece of legislation, fine piece. Who would write the purpose statement? Should it be me because it's my bill and I wrote it? Who writes the purpose statement? To a question to the author, please. Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Davids. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are many superlatives we can use for the 2016 tax bill, <laughs> many of them being a wonderful, amazing tax bill. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of this work is probably going to be done um, with our uh, Department of Revenue staff to be able to go back through and look through the statements that were made during that time period, talking to legislators if they're still current here to kind of understand that and you know that's I think that's a lot of the group that'll be doing that work but I can if house research staff has a better answer that's I'll let them weigh in um, but I think that this is again as the chair stated this is something that we should endeavor in doing so we can understand where we've come from so we know where we're going I'm sure representative and Davis. thank you for that answer but I don't like going back and having somebody from the department or somebody else telling me what my purpose was in the 2016 tax bill. Uh, that's not workable. And of course, and again, I, I won't belabor it. I know what uh, Chair Rest will do, and, but I can't comment on that. Yes, the less said about purpose statements in the Senate, the better, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Representative Davids. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and just to Representative Abajay, um, my guess is that these purpose statements would be written in our official books. So like when we get those series of books that everyone throws away at the end of session, would it, this is where those uh, st purpose statements would be added to in those 
uh, law books essentially when you look through and you know along the way um, where would this actually be written physically representative Agbaje thank you madam chair thank you representative Suzanne. yes I mean these would have to go back to be uh, put back into those chapters uh, where the the tax expenditures were listed representative Swidzinski thank you thank you madam chair and just uh, you know from a from a is there a cost statement you know as far as you know hours and I mean, I'm guessing it would take you know some staff person hours and hours to, to write this out and you know do we have a rough idea on that um, is there a, I, a representative Swidzinski there is no um, revenue estimate there's no for this bill. okay right. Ma madam chair has one been requested um, Representative Agbaje, I can go to uh, maybe to House Research or to Fiscal. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Swazinski, there's no fiscal note or a revenue estimate for the purpose statements. However, there is base funding for the Legislative Budget Office that was passed in 2021. Okay. Thank you, Representative Swazinski. So, so, thank you, Madam Chair. So, they were this bill as it sits we're assuming that the the department can just absorb the costs of the, the the labor and the time that it takes to go back and interview people and 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 talk about things and figure out what exactly that sort of is that I mean I don't know I'm just yeah a, good, a good question um, I, I think uh, you know so this bill is going to be laid over for possible okay. inclusion and so to Ms. Templin's point there was an allocation to the Legislative Budget Office. Some of the work that um, is laid out in Representative Agbaje's bill would naturally overlap with things that they are already doing. Um, you know, I will say that I, I think some of the, because the first um, couple years of the work of the, of the Tax Expenditure Review Commission, as I said, is about establishing the purpose statements where they don't currently exist in law. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think some of some of the expenditures that you'll see, and I see some of you guys have your uh, tax expenditure budget in front of you. Some of the expenditures that you'll see in there, you know, that that we sort of decided uh, don't need to have purpose statements added to them are generally kind of the ones that have you know that align with that are aligned with federal exemptions and have existed in law for a lot of years. And so, um, you know, to the extent that there are new expenditures. Um, in these bills that are that are covered by House File 916, that would be in the in the current purview um, of uh, of the work that the LBO is completing on behalf of the Turk. But um, but I think your questions are good, and that you know we do need to have just a little bit more conversation because I'll say like we're kind of like talking about the LBO right here. I haven't talked to them about this. I don't know if Representative Agbaje has had a chance to, but. Um, yeah, but but you know, as the intent in the committee today is to lay this over, I think that there's definitely time for those conversations to happen as we're putting together the omnibus tax bill. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just you know, it just it seems you know I, I kind of get the idea of it, and you know you had mentioned a little bit when in your kind of opening discussion about this particular bill and how we want to have transparency and openness about kind of the the purpose for this and why this was potentially passed. Like you know, because you know, sometimes this is not all just rainbows and 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 platitudes. Sometimes a reason uh, a, a, a tax expenditure is in here, whether what whatever that might be, is because someone traded it for a bonding bill request. Will I mean, will that type of thing be in the record, or will we kind of float over that? Like like how in depth will those conversations? Like will they say like? Representative so and so said this and this and this, you know, and this as Representative uh, David says in the dark of night in a smoke filled room. Um, With a bunch of high priced lobbyists. Well, I mean, will all that Probably. be in the record or, I mean, and, and <coughs> who, you know, I, I, I'm just trying to, yeah. I mean, I get the idea of it, but I'm like, is this kind of the, the high floaty flower stuff we're going to write or are we going to write the, well, you know, actually so and so representative wanted this thing done and so, that, so that's why this, you know, with the, the you know, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll turn to the author in a second, but I guess just um, in discussing the process that the LBO undertakes in order to establish purpose statements for individual expenditures, um, you know, that doesn't um, really 
get transferred into like a narrative that would get okay. added to statute or anything. It's sort of like they go through that process where they try to unearth the deal that happened in the smoke filled room with the high priced lobbyists and then they condense sort of whatever that intent was into, you know, I mean, you'll, you can see if you look in the tax expenditure budget because a lot of <coughs> our, especially our most, our more recent um, expenditures do have purpose statements already established for them. So you'll kind of see, I mean, they're, you know, a couple sentences long and they don't go into the, the narrative of like how we got to, okay. uh, to where we are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Sudzinski. Um, Re Representative Vag Badge, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, Inter to interrupt your the your your, uh, your presentation, but if you had anything to add, please. No, thank you, Madam Chair. I was uh, gonna say basically say the same thing. I mean, if you look at the bill, it's got examples in there of what the language would look like. Uh, for one, on line 2.4, the purpose of the exemption of Minnesota statute section 297A.70 subdivision 20 is to decrease maintenance costs for the ice arena. So kind of some, and the goal is to increase local. In local recreation opportunities and reduce local participation costs. So things like that would be what would be written. Uh, Representative Smith. Uh, yeah, I would just like to say, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, as a new legislator and a new member of this committee that has spent my weekends delightfully flipping through these documents. Um, I think, uh, just generally, I think this is a great idea. I think it'd be incredibly helpful to know some of these things. I am sympathetic to the fact that, especially in the past budgets and going over these things, the descriptions are gonna be imperfect. I think um, my colleagues are, are right about that, but I also think the establishing that pattern is gonna be so helpful going forward when we have more things close at mind of why we have passed these things. And so in 10 years, when someone is looking back on these expenditure documents, it'll be better. So I understand the, the nervousness of imperfectly going back and stating what our purposes was in 2016. But um, I think um, going forward, it will be extremely helpful. So I like this bill. Thank you, Representative, for bringing it forward. Thank you, Representative Smith. Um, and if anybody else wants to ingratiate themselves to the chair, please tell me about your weekend reading of tax documents. We'll be taking those submissions. Um, any further discussion from members on House File 916? And I'm not, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Representative Agbaje. Um, thank you, members. Thank you for the discussion. And um, I look forward to consideration in the larger omnibus tax bill. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, with that, um, House File 916 is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. All right. Next up is House File 1372. Um, we're, I'm going to be passing the gavel down to Vice Or are you going to switch, switch over? OK. OK, cool. And this is. Uh, Vice Chair Norris's first time chairing the committee, so please be nice to him. <laughs> Wait, should I not have said that? Yeah, that like, yeah. Yeah. You put a target on your back. Exactly. <laughs> should the should the chair have brought treats for his first time chairing the committee? I think I think we need. I think we're owed treats too. Two, two, days days two days of treats, yeah. Of treats. <laughs> so, <laughs> is there interest charged on on past due treats? Well, Mr. What Chair, if, if I may, I uh, was going to say that Wednesdays is the only really good day for me to bring treats because I remember I owe this committee treats. You do, but all darn it, unfortunately, it was canceled for Wednesday, so <laughs> it'll have to be next Wednesday. So there's no interest paid. I refuse to do that, but there will be treats next Wednesday. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, if I could make a few comments before the chair presents her bill, because to the bill that you haven't presented yet, um, I have to leave at 1.30, uh, and so the meeting should go much quicker, much smoother <laughs> after 1.30. <clears throat> but what I would like to offer to the chair and this is the technical or the corrections or not corrections. Uh, what's it called? Technical and policy. Policy, policy and technical, and technical bill. bill. Now, in the past, you kind of have to read through these because sometimes there's stuff that's not so policy or technical. There's some pretty big stuff in there we found over the years, but that's the past. We're not going to write a purpose statement for what happened in the past. <laughs> that being said, uh, we have studied this bill. I've studied the bill. I think it looks great. I think there's some things that we should do here and get this thing through as quick as we can. 
Um, and normally I've been against that. You just do one omnibus bill, otherwise on the floor it's death by a thousand cuts. And but what I would pledge to you that I would do everything from this side that if it did go to the floor uh, and was passed out, we would not offer amendments. Uh, and I don't think there's anyone that would be against it. I won't talk for the whole committee here, but uh, if there's some way we could, like we did on the, on the conformity bill, let's get her through. There's some good stuff in here for fire departments. I mean, just go down the list. And it is policy and technical on this one. It's not major policy changes. So just food for thought. I won't go away mad. I'll just go away. Um, and have a good rest of the committee, but that's what I would offer you if you're interested. If not, that's fine too. That's good, Chair. Uh, Chair Gomez, after that preamble by Lee Davids, <laughs> to your bill. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> Purpose <you>. statement. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, Representative Davids, and happy to, we'll discuss that more between us uh, moving forward, but I appreciate the, the comment, and um, and yeah, want, we I think we all want to get good work done on the places where we can agree. So appreciate the suggestion. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you. And Chair Gomez, if you'd like to move your bill. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I'd move that uh, House File 1372 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. All right. Uh, please proceed with the description of your bill. Thank Chair Gomez. you, Mr. Chair. Um, so House File 1372 is the Department of Revenue's policy and technical bill. And that's as much as I can describe about the bill. And I, I would like to turn it over to my testifier with that, if possible, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Uh, first up is uh, Ms. Bears. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joanna Bears. I'm the legislative director at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. We first want to thank Chair Gomez for authoring this bill. Uh, we appreciate the work that she's uh, done on this with us and her staff. We also appreciate the, the relationship we have with them and the work that they've uh, done with this bill to make sure it's in the shape it is today. We also appreciate uh, Chair uh, Davis's comments as well. Um, uh, as you may know, one of our missions at the department is working to, together to fund the future for all Minnesota. And together is the most important word in our mission, because again, we can't do it with all of, uh, we can't do that without all of you, you and your staff. So thank you uh, very much for, for doing that. One of the key strategies to achieve our mission is to provide superior service by engaging in meaningful interaction with customers. And during these interactions, we often notice or hear items in the tax code that could be updated, clarified, or just made a little bit more clear. And some of these items may seem relatively small, but they're very important uh, to ensure that we are providing customers with the information, the education, and the services that they need to effectively navigate Minnesota's tax obligation and opportunities. At the department, the engagement and meaningful interaction does not end there. For the last six months, we worked with our new Office of Public Engagement uh, to reach out to stakeholders who may have an interest in this bill. We received a lot of great, valuable feedback, and we've incorporated many of those changes right into our bill. Uh, we do continue to welcome the opportunity to have those conversations. So if you do have questions regarding any of these provisions, we're happy to take them here, and we're happy to uh, you know, discuss them offline as well. Uh, with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to our first testifier, uh, who will walk through Article 1. All right. All uh... right. Mr. Iden, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jeremy Iden. I'm an attorney with the Minnesota Department of Revenue in the Corporate Franchise Tax Division. I'll be going over the first half of the first article, which is the income and corporate franchise taxes. Sections one, two, and five relate to the pass-through and composite tax income definitions. The composite tax and the pass-through entity tax have their own definitions of income. What we are doing here is just moving those definitions from Chapter 289A into, chap into Chapter 290 under the regular definition of income. Section 2 also deals with the pass-through entity tax. It does two things. It amends 289A.08 subdivision 7A to clarify that only limited liability companies that are taxed as partnerships or S corporations are available to be a qualifying entity for the, for the pass-through entity tax. This section also adds a new subdivision that, <clears throat> that makes it clear that once an entity, or an entity 
A qualifying entity may not claim a refund once the credits are passed down and claimed by the qualifying owners. Only the qualifying owners may claim that refund. The described changes in this section are effective retroactively for taxable years beginning after December 31st of 2020. Section 3 amends 289A.382 subdivision 2 and this is to clarify and make it clear that if they're in the event of a federal partnership audit, a pass-through entity must amend their Minnesota return and pay any additional tax due. Section 4 <coughs> amends 289A.50 to add a new subdivision 3A <coughs> and this is to clarify that when there is an overpayment of non-resident withholding tax by a partnership or S corporation, the refund allowable under that section is limited to <coughs> the amount of overpayment that was not deducted and withheld from the shares of the payer's partners or shareholders. This section is effective the day after final enactment. And Section 6 <coughs> adds a new section to 29006, subdivision 22, paragraph <coughs> M, so that sole members of an entity disregarded for income tax purposes can receive a credit for taxes paid in, uh, by that entity in another state. And this is effectible, effective for taxable years beginning after December 31st of 2022. And those, that concludes my section. And uh, thank you, Mr. Iden. Members, since we've got a number of testifiers on this bill, uh, we'll, we'll pause after each testifier and see if there are any questions or comments from the committee. Now, Representative Pinto, did you want to get no. in? Okay. Okay, thanks. Perfect. <clears throat> All right. I think we have. All right. Then uh, next up is uh, Mr. Santhopoulos. Um, and uh, Mr. Santhopoulos, I trust you're one of our state's leading tax experts and not just the person with the longest last name at the, the <laughs> agency that they bring out for first time chairs. So. <laughs> Please proceed with your testimony. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Nick Santopoulos. I'm the staff attorney at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. I'll be covering section seven through 12 of article one. Section seven and eight amend the working family credits to clarify that only the maximum credit amount is phased out. If the taxpayer's adjusted gross income or earned income, whichever is greater exceeds the threshold amount. These sections are effective the day following final enactment. Section 9 amends the credit for parents of stillborn children. It allows the credit to an individual who experiences a stillbirth outside of Minnesota if they receive a certificate similar to the certificate under Section 144.2151 that documents the stillbirth occurred under applicable local laws. This section is effective for taxable years beginning after December 31st, 2022. And Mr. Chair, before I move on to section 10, I would like to apologize for a typo in the bill summary. The summary refers to section 144.2141, but it should refer to section 144.2151. However, the bill at page 13, line four, correctly points to section 144-2151. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Section 10 relates to withholding taxes for periodic payments and non-periodic distributions, such as annuities and IRA distributions on demand. It establishes a withholding rate of 6.25% for the rate directed by the recipient. It also makes non-substantive organizational changes for readability and clarity. This section is effective for periodic payments and non-periodic distributions made on or after the day, file, the day following final enactment. For periodic payments and non-periodic distributions made on or after the day following final enactment, but before January 1, 2024, the Commissioner of Revenue must not assess penalties relating to this amendment against the payor who complies with Minnesota Statutes 2021 Supplement, Section 290.92, Subdivision 20. Section 11 clarifies language for identifying an out-of-state business in Section 290.9705, which may require withholding by someone who hires an out-of-state contractor to perform construction work. 
the section is effective the day following final enactment. And finally, section 12 amends the definition of quote, property taxes payable, unquote, under the Property Tax Refund Act in chapter 290 capital A. The property tax statutes were amended to move the homestead application deadline from December 15 to December 31. This section harmonizes chapter 290 capital A with that amendment by changing the homestead application deadline for property tax refunds from December 15 to December 31. This section is effective retroactively beginning with refund claims based on property taxes payable in 2022. That concludes article one unless there are any questions. Any questions members? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our next testifier. Thank you. All right, next I believe we have Ms. Reisdorf. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name uh, and organization for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Margaret Reisdorf and I'm an attorney here at the Department of Revenue. I'm gonna be walking you through Article 2. Article 2 is um, proposed, provides proposed amendments for the fire state aid and police state aid programs. It's phase two of a two-part recodification process. Um, that began um, with the department working with um, the Office of the State Auditor, the members of the Minnesota Fire Coalition, the Fire Chiefs Association, the State Fire Department Association, the International Association of Arson Investigators, the Fire Marshal Association, the Minnesota Professional Firefighters, um, as well as members of the Minnesota Police Chiefs Association, the Department of Public Safety, as well as a subject matter expert from the city of Moundsview. Um, Phase one of this recodification was enacted in 2019. And as I said before, this is, this is part two that provides clarifying language. Um, would you like me to go over the highlights or I can go section by section, whatever you prefer? I think the highlights would be fine. Thank you, Mr. Reister. Okay, as I mentioned, in 2019, the legislature passed phase one of this recodification. At that time, both the fire and police state aids were both contained in um, chapter 69 of the Minnesota statutes. Now they are organized in their own sections, 477B um, for fire aid and 477 cap C for police aid. So the changes that you have here in article two just simply add clarification and detail to that phase one process. Specifically, um, um, they provide deadlines and procedures where statutes are currently silent so that um, uh, fire departments and police departments know when to provide information to the department and to the state auditor so that they can get aid paid to them in a timely and accurate fashion. Um, it also addresses how we can um, take care of clerical errors that might occur in the aid and how to recompute those. Um, and then finally, it just allows um, for the fire and the police departments to be able to have clear rules so that they can operate and provide public safety services and not worry about the administration of aids under this chapter. Um, and then finally, the final section eliminates um, outdated and redundant language in section 25. But I'm happy that concludes, in, unless someone has questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions, members? All right. Oh, there we go. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I have a comment. Comment. Go ahead, Representative Anderson. Thank you. Um, Interim Chair Norris, right? Is that the title, correct? Sure. I'll take any title I can get. Interim? I don't know. <laughs> Chair. Um, I just um, want to echo what um, Representative Great David said that I think um, if it makes sense, you know, that this could go as a standalone and I'd be happy to um, sign on. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Any other questions or comments before our next testifier? All right, thank you, Ms. Reisdorf. Next up is uh, Ms. Morrow. Uh, please uh, state your name and organization for the record and welcome to the committee. Thank you, my name is Cecilia Morrow. I'm an attorney at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. In Article 3, regarding data practices, sections 1, 2, and 7 relate to two reports the department is required to produce the tax incident study and the homestead property tax burden study. The proposed amendments clarify existing law regarding the authority for interagency data sharing and applicable statutory cross-references. 
Section 1 clarifies that welfare data may be disclosed to the Department of Revenue by the Department of Human Services to prepare the databases used for these two reports. Section 2 authorizes the Department of Revenue to request information from any state officer or agency for use in preparing the biennial tax incident study and to the extent permitted by law requires the production of the data. Similarly, for the preparation of the Homestead Property Tax Burden Study, Section 7 authorizes the Department of Revenue to request information from any state officer or agency and to the extent permitted by law requires production of the data. All three of these sections become effective the day following final enactment. Section 3 amends the statute under which the Department of Revenue is required to publish the names of paid tax preparers who have violated various state laws to include a preparer who has been penalized for failing to include the unique preparer, federal preparer tax identification number they were required to have and include on returns they prepare for clients. This section is effective for returns filed after December 31, 2023. Section 4 amends the property tax refund program to wire, require landlords who issue a certificate of rent paid, a CRP, to provide their tax identification number to the Department of Revenue when there is an electronic filing of the CRPs by the landlords with the department. Having the tax ID number will allow the department to authenticate individuals or entities that submit a CRP to the department. A landlord's taxpayer identification number is not included on the forms that a, a renter receives. With regard to the development of an electronic filing system, Revenue has consulted with the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. This section is effective beginning with property tax refund claims based on rent paid in 2023. Sections 5 and 6 provide clarifying changes in order to comply with IRS requirements for providing Minnesota state agencies with federal tax information, including requiring national FBI criminal history checks for anyone who will have access to such data. Section 5 adds the Attorney General as a requesting agency subject to criminal history record information checks. Section C strikes references to, quote, agent, close quote, and, quote, any other individual authorized to access federal tax information, close quote, as this language was rejected as too broad by the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI under the governing federal law. Both of these sections are effective the day following final enactment. That concludes Article 3. Thank you, Ms. Morrow. Uh, any member questions or comments? All right. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, uh, we have Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Peterson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name and organization for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mark Peterson. I'm an attorney with the Department of Revenue. I'll take you through the rest of the bill. Sections 1 and 2 amend the law that allows the commissioner to enter into tax agreements with Indian tribes. Commissioners had this authority since about 1980. Uh, one of the key parts of these agreements has been that uh, the tribes have agreed to collect sales, uh, sales and excise taxes on the reservation at the state rate and on the state base. In exchange, the state and the tribes share the revenues generated from those on-reservation sales. Part of the payment to the tribes has historically been in a form of a per capita payment, which is meant to return to the tribe the taxes paid on the reservation by the members, which are taxes that under applicable federal law, the U.S. Supreme Court has said the states have no jurisdiction to impose. So, since about 1990, the statute and our agreements have required the use of a population number that is taken off of a report published by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. However, we need to change the law now because the Bureau of Indian Affairs is no longer compiling or publishing that report. So we're amending the, the proposing to amend the law to require the population report of the members living on or adjacent <laughs> to the reservation as reported to the tribe um, directly to the Commissioner of Revenue. Now, at first blush, that might seem like a really big change, but the truth is that the population reports that were submitted by, or published by the BIA uh, were compiled largely, if, if not really, probably totally from information that was submitted by the tribes themselves. So essentially, we were getting the information from the tribe through the BIA. Now we'll get it directly. 
The language is also being amended to clarify the purpose of those per capita refunds and how they'll be calculated. And those are consistent with how the refunds have been determined in, in the past. Section three amends men care provision uh, 290.50 subdivision four to clarify that uh, health care providers for purposes of men care tax do not include a person who uh, who receives all their payments for for patient services from a source of funds that is exempt or excluded from tax. This conforms to a 2019 tax <coughs> law change that amended uh, 295.53 to divide those things into tax exemptions and tax exclusions. Either way, there's no tax due on it. Um, it also changes a reference to this chapter um, to just the MinCare provisions in Chapter 295 to reflect the fact that the MinCare tax is not the only tax imposed under Chapter 295. Section 4 amends the date the Commission is required to publish the surtax rate on gasoline from April 1 of each year to May 1 of each year. That's for the rate that goes into effect uh, on July 1. Uh, this corresponds to a 2021 law change that changes the date the Commissioner of MMB has to notify the Commissioner of Revenue. Uh, that was changed from March 1 of each year to April 1 of each year. So we, we need more time. We can't publish it the same day that we get the information from the, from the Commissioner of MMB. This is a surcharge that's used to, to repay some trunk highway bonds that were authorized in 2009. Uh, also removes some obsolete language related to the surtax that was in effect the first few years that it was being imposed. And section five amends the definition of state for purposes of the sales tax to conform to recent change in streamlined sales tax definition. Under current law, state includes the 50 plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. The change will include all U.S. territories, including Guam, Virgin Islands, and Northern Mariana I Islands. Uh, in response to um, interest uh, shown by Guam uh, that recently enacted their own sales tax. And Great. that's my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Questions or comments from the Yes, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, could we... I'm not familiar with uh, the sections one and two. Is that, can you what what the taxes are we talking about there? And just give me a little brief information on that. Sure, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Peterson, Representative. We uh, the commission has the authority to enter into tax agreements with tribes that cover sales and excise taxes. So right now we've got agreements with ten ten of the eleven tribes that cover sales tax. They cover uh, liquor cigarette, tobacco, gasoline, um, excise taxes, uh, as well as the, the um, fee, and Lewis uh, fee and Lewis settlement on cigarettes. Anything further, Representative Kosnick? Uh, that's great, thanks. Uh, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just uh, and a, just a just different question, kind of along those same lines. Um, <clears throat> do you have a rough estimate of you know, that revenue sharing just off the top of your head? And then which, uh, which uh, tribe of the 11 does not participate? Mr. Peterson. Mr. Chair, Representative Sinski. Um, Prairie Island, we do not have an agreement with Prairie Island. I, I can get the, in, the numbers. I don't have the, the, um, the actual numbers by, uh, for the refunds Thank you. Uh, or tax collection fee there. Mr. Chair, and, and just to follow up to that then, so, so what occurs then with Prairie Island do, does uh, the sales tax just not get collected on those sales? Do they keep all the collections? Just what, what's the process there? How does that work? Mr. Peterson. Do you know? I mean, I'm just asking in general because you're talking about Yeah, I, um, Mr. Chair, Representative, I, I don't know if I can really tell you. I mean, because it's, it's taxpayer like return information, so I can't really tell you if a specific taxpayer is paying sales tax information. I mean, I can't really tell you. Um, that would be confidential on whether or not they're paying. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything further from the members before we move on to public testimony? All right. Thank you, Mr. Peterson.
Uh, we'll move on to public testimony. Uh, first on the list is Chief Andrew Slama uh, from the Minnesota Fire Association Coalition and the Dinah Fire Chief. Welcome to the committee, uh, Chief Slama. Please uh, state your name and organization for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for allowing me to testify. My name is Andrew Slama. Slama. And Slama. I am here representing Apologies. the Minnesota Fire Association Coalition, or MINFAC. MINFAC is made up of the Minnesota Fire Chiefs Association, the Minnesota State Fire Department's Association, the Minnesota Arson Investigators, and the Minnesota Fire Marshals Association. We represent over 700 fire chiefs and 23,000 firefighters across the state of Minnesota. We want to thank Chair Gomez for carrying House File 1372, specifically Article 2. We thank you and the Department of Revenue staff for working to update the antiquated language that directs the Department of Revenue on how to administer fire state aids. Additionally, we want to thank Representative Howard and former Tax Chair Davids for their willingness to introduce these firefighter definitions and updates into a standalone bill. We're grateful, grateful for former Tax Chairs Nelson and Mark Hort who included these provisions in the proposed 2022 omnibus tax bill. And we would like to thank both the current commissioners of revenue and the previous commissioners of revenue and the many people at the Department of Revenue who have worked through the details over many meetings. Article two of this bill addresses the Department of Revenue clarifying language only. We are honored to work with the many people at Department of Revenue to make sure this updated language works for everyone. Uh, while this legislation is technical in nature and relatively small compared to the many, many issues that you deal with as a committee, the issue is very important to us in the fire service and ensures that public dollars that were intended for the fire department are not misappropriated. Again, thank you, Chair Gomez and Representative Howard and former Chair Davids. We appreciate your support and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Chief Slema. Uh, any member questions or comments for the chief? All right, uh, thank you, Chief Slama. Uh, any other uh, testifiers from the public who wish to step forward and testify on the bill? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, Chair Gomez, additional comments? Uh, just thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the committee and um, to Representatives Anderson and Davids for their comments about possibly moving this forward. Uh, as a standalone, happy to have that conversation moving forward. And um, before we adjourn, I just wanted to make a quick announcement about schedule, but yeah, do that's awkward, let's, I don't finish, know. Let's, let's renew the motion <laughs> okay, first, yep. and then, then I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you to do that. Uh, so Chair Gomez, would you like to renew your motion on the bill? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Chair Gomez renews her motion that House File 1372 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus tax bill. It is laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, Chair Gomez, closing comments. Uh, thank you. So I just wanted to say, I think we maybe talked about it earlier in um, in committee, but Chair Lissagard has a lot of uh, work on his plate. And so tomorrow, property taxes is going to be meeting during this time. And so you all are off the hook unless you're on property taxes also. Um, and we'll be reconvening here on Thursday to hear a couple of bills. So thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Chair Gomez. And with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.